Uh, let's return to our top story, and that is, of course, the developments that are coming out of the United States. Um, we've been listening a few minutes ago to Joe Biden um, making his first speech since uh, the defeat of his Democratic Party um, in those U.S. elections. Uh, we've also heard that Donald Trump is uh, starting to um, assess people for his uh, cabinet uh, team, uh, cabinet posts, and also uh, for his staff at the White House. Uh, well, to get a grip of some of those things and to assess the latest developments and what the president-elect's coming days and weeks might look like, I'm joined now on the line from Washington by Arise International correspondent Adefemi Akinsoya. Uh, good to see you, Adefemi, and thank you very much indeed for uh, joining us. Let's start with Mr. Uh, Biden's speech, uh, which I, I presume that you, you saw. Um, he said a lot about the past and the future. What stood out for you in that speech? Definitely. Well, firstly, Charles, he didn't speak for very long. And when you think about the fact that both he and Kamala Harris, both of their speeches were highly anticipated, but perhaps not very long in duration, it did uh, leave a little to be desired. For Joe Biden specifically, I think what jumped out to me is the fact that he did express an air of acceptance. This is not the outcome we wanted, but this is the outcome we've got, essentially. He stood in front of members of his cabinet, of his team, people who have spent the last, uh, definitely the last few weeks and months uh, preparing for an outcome directly opposite to the one that they had received. So hearing him talk about how the fact that sometimes you are judged not by the failure, not by the falling down, but in how fast you stand back up again. I do think that that was one of the stick out points for me because it was very interesting to hear what he had to say. A lot of critics will say that this election might have been lost uh, because Joe Biden took so long to step aside. Perhaps had he stepped out of the race sooner, given Kamala Harris more time to prepare a campaign, perhaps the outcome would have been different. It's interesting because, as you know, Joe Biden is the only candidate who's been able to beat Trump. And essentially what we've seen in this election is that the same couldn't be replicated for Kamala Harris. So it begs the question of why. Well, if we look at the voters and the demographics of the voters, we do know that overwhelmingly black women did vote for Kamala Harris across the nation, but white women didn't. They voted in, in, in huge numbers for Donald Trump. That's also the case for Latino voters, especially Latino men, voting again overwhelmingly for Donald Trump. So it does beg the question of a separation between what Americans desire currently in this moment and what they think a Trump administration, another Trump administration, would give to them. This is, of course, happening against the backdrop of a cost of living crisis where many Americans that we've spoken to are directly focused on which political candidate, which president will be able to lead them out of the struggles that they are currently facing. Oftentimes in elections all over the world, people will tend to vote uh, in line with their current set of circumstances. And if you are currently suffering economic hardship, you're struggling to feed your families, to feed yourself, you're struggling uh, to earn a good living, to make your income stretch, you're struggling with healthcare costs, you're struggling with a lot. Uh, you tend to blame the current government in power at that time. But what is interesting here is that the two political parties uh, are, are so starkly different that clearly you've seen the electorate move so far away from the base uh, and, and focus on what they believe a Trump presidency could deliver for them. So it's very interesting at, at, at hand and at present. But for, for Joe Biden specifically, I wonder if he feels as though his own political legacy will be tarnished by this loss, the fact that he couldn't deliver a predecessor from his own party, especially since the candidate in question was his own vice presidential pick. We do know that Joe Biden himself was once a vice president behind uh, President Obama. Obama went from being president for two terms and then we had the incoming of Trump who couldn't beat, who did beat rather Hillary Clinton and then came in Joe Biden again able to beat him but unable to do so for a second time. So very, very mixed feelings here in Washington, D.C. And for, for Joe Biden himself, it does seem as though he has come to the natural end of his political life. He's accepted that his party has lost this uh, election and has called on his supporters to pick themselves up 
and try again in the next four years. Well, indeed. And I was going to ask you, I think you made some really good, very interesting points there, um, um, Femi. Um, he did make a brief reference to his election. And of course, that he, I mean, the, this election that just went um, past and uh, that, as you said, will be forever tainted by this, uh, the fact that um, Kamala Harris had to step in. But I wonder what the mood is like generally. I mean, are the knives out for President Biden? Because, I mean, it was after that disastrous debate performance by him that the pressure grew. And in the end, he was forced to step aside and Kamala Harris then took over. Definitely. I mean, that is a set of circumstances. So when you're looking at the mood here, if there is any blame to go down from the people that we've spoken to, it's more so to the voters and less towards uh, President Biden himself. I do think that for people who did want Kamala Harris to win this election, they've also accepted that it comes with an acceptance of Joe Biden as a president that they care about, a president who clearly uh, was not perfect, but one in whom they felt could lead them in terms of uh, a democratic power uh, power position uh, into the future. That's clearly not what we've seen from the outcome of the election. But I don't think, according to the people that we've spoken to over the past couple of days, that this is a situation that they uh, have blamed and laid blame at the feet of Joe Biden. I think this is more so an issue of voters and why it is that clearly a lot of people who had already been voting for Democrats decided either to abstain from voting or vote for a vote for another party. And I think that that's where a lot of questions are being raised here. There is a lot of disappointment, but I, I think geographically that's because we are in a, a democratic stronghold. We're in Washington, D.C. We've been in New York City. We've been in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, all states that remain blue, all states that Kamala Harris was able to take. So naturally, the people here are quite disappointed. And that's across a set of racial lines. But if we were to go into other areas of the United States, towards the southern states, going to Florida, to Georgia, even uh, more out west to Arizona, Nevada, it would be interesting again to hear what people have to say. That's not to say that Donald Trump doesn't have supporters here in the Northeast. He absolutely does have them even here in the, in the country's capital. But clearly there is some sort of disparity between the jubilation of uh, the Republican victory and the somberness that we're seeing on the streets of Washington, D.C. just at the minute. Well, absolutely. And let me um, go away from sort of Joe Biden for a minute and go to Donald Trump. I mean, um, he's won the ballot, obviously, and uh, there's a lot of talk about him choosing his cabinet now. I wonder what names you might have heard and, and who they might be. Well, it's still very, very interesting times ahead, isn't it? And I think that that is definitely going to be where a lot of attention shifts to. Who is Donald Trump going to align himself with? And it's going to be quite, as I said, quite an interesting process because when we look at people who were standing in his way or people who were standing against him in the early parts of this election, it does seem as though for the likes of RFK, for example, he did make clear that he didn't even want to be on the ballot come election day and that he did throw his weight behind Donald Trump and it is likely that he will be, I don't want to use the word rewarded, but it's likely that he will be brought into the fold of the Trump administration and perhaps be given some form of a secretarial position. It will be again also interesting to see uh, who Donald Trump chooses in significant positions, whether or not he will continue on with people he aligned himself with the first time he was in office, or whether or not he will pick from a different batch of candidates. Donald Trump has over the years created a huge list of enemies, but Interestingly enough, a lot of them have come out to support him too. Now, if we look at his last vice president, Mike Pence, we do know that over the course of the years, Mike Pence came out and said that you know Donald Trump wasn't the greatest leader, didn't lead a great example, did put a lot of pressure on him to break the law, to lie for him, to do things that he did not want to do. And in response, we did hear, again, over the years, Donald Trump used very harsh language against uh, former Vice President Mike Pence, even to some extent, to some interpretations, which death upon him. But Mike Pence delivered a, a statement, released a statement congratulating Trump. And it seems as though trying to, uh, trying to get back into his good graces, perhaps looking for a position in Trump's cabinet or his government. It's, it's not clear whether or not that will materialize because, as I said, over the years, especially with Trump's legal issues, he has won a lot of political enemies. But 
he is now the new sheriff in town. He is going to become uh, the 47th president of the United States come inauguration in January. And you can imagine that people in the United States who are looking for a position in his government are, are going to be rallying around him, hoping to get a phone call. This is, of course, happening at a time where Donald Trump is likely to be an incredibly powerful president very, very powerful with the fact that the Senate and the House are likely to be uh, in Republican control. And it will allow him to deliver on his campaign promises of mass deportations immediately. And that has huge ramifications for the United States. I can imagine that many people are sleeping quite uneasily with the prospect of somebody riding the coattails of a very hardline immigration policy. So he's going to have a need to have very strong heavy hitters in his cabinet. So it will be interesting to see which politicians, whether or not we know them already, whether or not there'll be new voices who will find themselves uh, getting a phone call from the president. We do know that he's, of course, aligned himself with the likes of Elon Musk and different uh, entrepreneurs too. And the, the social media aspect has definitely played a role in his re-emergence in this historic re-election. But it is, uh, to some extent, perhaps a little too early to tell who the, the real prospects are for different uh, positions in the Trump administration. But it is it, 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 it's naturally going to be something that many people are going to be anticipating looking forward. Femi, thanks very much indeed. And Femi Akinsoya is a RISE international correspondent. She was talking to me on the line there from Washington.